So um, I trust that some of you uh, might have read the paper. So um, I will focus this presentation uh, more on um, talking about the, the general structural problems that I'm investigating through my ethnography, um, which also might be of, of kind of greater interest beyond the specific specificities of sort of anthropological interest um, to the thing. Um, now, sociologists, um, anthropologists of journalists, uh, journalism know it rather well that the profession of journalism is, um, un is characterized by structural, uh, pr a structural predicament of producing under um, a variety of political and economic pressures. As an anthropologist, I'm interested in the specificity of these cultural and social specificities of these tensions uh, in Ukraine and the specificity of how a particular group of liberal elite journalists um, and media professionals uh, deal with these tensions um, in contemporary Kyiv, specifically um, in a post-Maidan post uh, political uh, economy of the media. Now, to explore these issues, I conducted a year-long fieldwork, which uh, finished just in June this year, um, with uh, a variety of, of different groups uh, of journalists, but main, mainly Horomatsky and Suspilne, or the two public broadcasters in Kyiv, as well as um, a number of other organizations uh, focusing on the um, uh, transformation of uh, and pro reprofessionalization of Ukrainian journalism. And um, I call these groups um, kind of a, a movement for an ethical and professional reform of journalism. And, and, and what follows that, I'd like to tease out you know, why it is important to focus on a reformist movement and what this reformist movement means in the current conditions in Ukraine. But before that, um, I think, oops. Sorry, some pictures. Um, that, that's mostly all of it is from Hromadske, um, which is a small liberal, liberal public broadcaster in Kyiv, which most of you probably will know about. And that uh, um, funny picture is what the Ukrainian public broadcaster should have looked like in 1991. That's the national, uh, former um, National Broadcasting Corporation of Ukraine, which was never fully built. And, and um, as it happens, will not be built after Maidan in, and, and not, not be constructed and, and kind of created after Maidan because of the cut funding. Anyway, um, it, there is an established argument um, in uh, kind of post-socialist media studies that um, th throughout the 90s uh, there was um, a rapid uh, process of deprofessionalization of journalism and uh, an anthropologist Natalia Rodakova describes uh, how uh, a rapid hyperinflation, withdrawal of state funding, and privatization of media subjected Russian journalists uh, to a variety of financial and political pressures and, and new media logics, uh, which meant that within three or four years, there was an all but, uh, oh, within the three or four years of the collapse of the Soviet journalism, there was all but an erosion of all professional norms of, of journalism. Um, practically, this meant that reporters and editors uh, were left on their own trying to um, scramble for some funding, retain employment, and uh, make some money in an economy where doing all of this meant coming into relations of uh, quite radical dependency uh, on uh, new capitalists, old new elites, and new political entrepreneurs in the 90s. Uh, something very similar, I think, happened in Ukraine, uh, where politicians and emergent oligarchs as early as 94 um, we realized that the old logic of political command um, of journalism um, could be adapted uh, in a new social political order um, in order to use uh, reporters for uh, within uh, new liberalized political struggles. And um, this has led to uh, one important uh, cultural change which sets the context for, for my fieldwork, for my research, namely the political instrumentalization of journalism and uh, a practice uh, which is widely known as JINSA, so paid for news, um, have bred a pervasive hermeneutic of suspicion um, among both journalists and their audiences. Um, now, I don't know to what extent this hermeneutic of suspicion is consistent with older um, socialist uh, practices of reading between the lines and practices of kind of interpreting um, uh, public discourse. Um, but from as early as 95, I think, um, th there is a traceable in Russia and in Ukraine, but of course, much of the research focuses on Russia. Um, as early as 95 and onwards, uh, there have been a kind of a traceable um, public suspicion uh, towards um, any form of public discourse as manipulated and manipulative. Right? So this is what I call the hermeneutic of suspicion. Suspicion there focuses on um, 
the fact that any public utterance uh, might be uh, financially or politically motivated, right? So this is uh, understanding um, essentially a heuristic which um, tries to explain public utterances by whatever structural and personal interests these public utterances might, might serve, um, which, you know, looks like a, a liberal public discussion uh, to me, but uh, because, of course, uh, all, discourse, all discourse is interested, but for some reason, uh, and I actually don't know the answer, and maybe you could help me tease this out a bit more, um, th this fact um, that truth-telling and uh, public utterances are motivated was um, uh, has been conceptualized uh, as, as, a pro as a kind of severe problem in, in Russia and Ukraine. Um, now, of course, there is a, there are structural reasons uh, to um, to suspect uh, that uh, political and other forms of journalism in Ukraine and Russia are being manipulated and are being manipulative. Um, but it's a slightly different question. Um, but I think to journalists who uh, see the situation of dependency on owners and oligarchs, who are mostly media owners in Ukraine. Uh, so for those journalists who see the situation as problematic, um, there is um, there is a kind of a distinctive drive to try and deal both with the question of dependency, um, just financial dependency and, and dependency of employment, and the question of this culture of suspicion towards what they do. Because um, as, and I'm simplifying here, so forgive me for uh, really glossing over a lot of detail, um, but for... Um, Many of my informants, um, one of the big problems was to communicate sincerity and, and truthfulness of their speech um, despite and against um, this pervasive suspicion towards what they do. A suspicion that Hromadske, uh, be it or, or you know, anyone else, where, wherever they work, um, are motivated by uh, the grants that they receive or by the funding or by hidden, uh, necessarily hidden political agendas that they are... Um, so expected to um, to promote. So this hermeneutic of suspicion sets uh, a problem for um, for a profession where, um, like journalism, where uh, freedom of speech is one of the chief organizing values of, of professionalism. Because how do you communicate? Uh, well, how, first of all, how do you achieve uh, freedom of speech practically and processually in the process of your work? A B, and how do, how do you communicate that you are speaking freely? And so this is what my research really has been uh, uh, focusing on, um, in that I was trying to understand uh, both how journalists uh, kind of conceptualize and relate to uh, a particular articulation of the value of free speech, which comes with certain Western discourses about liberal journalism, and how they realize it um, under practical and uh, kind of socioeconomic and social cultural constraints that, that come from the profession. And uh, the paper uh, deals with um, one deals with these questions uh, through a discussion of one case, uh, one controversy around uh, the Zeke uh, TV channel in February 2017. I will not go into the detail uh, over that, but suffice it to say that um, that case I think highlights rather well uh, discussions around it, which I then discuss um, uh, discussion discussions among Hromadske journalists, which I describe. They really highlight um, the kind of Debates and dynamics, um, which put in relation all these problems that I've just discussed, um, and so if Natalia Rudakova and others describe a process of deprofessionalization um, in Russia and in Ukraine, then I suppose uh, what I'm studying is a process of reprofessionalization, which is an attempt to put in motion uh, a specific uh, and distinctly Anglo-American. Uh, model of professional journalism uh, in a uh, which is promoted by uh, Western, mostly British, Swedish uh, grant givers, uh, which is promoted in this political economic context uh, and this cultural context. And Hromadske and others um, are some of the organizations which uh, are realizing um, this model of journalism. And this model of journalism, being professional and speaking freely, I argue, uh, means uh, demonstrating uh, certain forms of detachment detachment of your speech from monetary, so detachment of the sort of sincere value of free speech from the monetary value of speech. So for example, anxiety about being paid at all, or you know, about talking about money. Uh, then detachment of signs of influence and signs of interest from 
um, signs of disinterest, disinterestedness, which uh, you know brings a particular kind of ethical and textual reflection and um, uh, detail um, um, and attention to the discourse, and then also attempts to um, avoid um, certain uh, career paths. And I, I briefly uh, note all of these in the paper, and I hope that we can discuss them further now. Okay, thank you so much.